Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today, we have Stephen Kimball, who's one of the top direct response marketers. 20 years? It's been 20 years, Stephen? Correct. 20, All right, 20 yeah. years. His copywriting has made millions of dollars in extra profits for direct response companies, big and small. He, I couldn't even get through the huge list of companies on his site, and he said that's only maybe half of them. His clients include companies like GE, Omaha Steaks, National Geographic, Cutco Knives, and many, many more. Stephen, thanks for joining me. Thank you for having me. I'm excited. And we were talking a little bit before the interview started um, about... You know, companies ask you so many marketing questions. Tell me what happened with the GE insurance. What were they asking you? What did you tell them? So this was a case where they had uh, they had come up with some mailers, and they had mailed them, and they had done very poorly. And so they showed them to me, and they they wanted to try again. And I, you know, so we got on the phone and we talked. Their marketing people and me. And they started asking me a lot of questions about their audience and about what they should be saying and, and about what appeals to people. And I've, I've done this before. This is certainly not the first time I've had these kind of conversations. But a lot of times I have them with people who are fairly new. Um, and this was something, you know, a Fortune 500 company who has their marketing people can obviously pay top dollar for talent. Mm -hmm. um, yet when it come to a, came to a lot of basic marketing know how and understanding they, they really didn't know that they they're marketing professionals without a, a deep insight into what makes people tick what makes them buy what motivates them yeah. what to say to them and uh, that that's something that often kind of uh, intrigues me that there are a lot of marketing people who really don't understand marketing they know how to get it done but they don't know about the uh, you know what what's behind it what right. motivates them? And so I just remember that conversation thinking to myself, I, I, I can't believe these people at G are asking me what they should be doing. Um, right. But again, not something I haven't been through before a lot of other companies. Yeah. So what did you tell them? Do you remember what was the deep um, kind of emotional buying that they had no idea that you told them about? Well, the, the tact they had taken was to tell them basically nothing. Um, they'd sent the mail packages, a uh, so mix of letters and postcards that were big on graphics, little on promise and benefits and, and guarantees. And I was trying to explain to them, you, you can't just expect these people to get this in the, po in the mailbox and say, hey, great, G's got insurance. It's not just about letting them know you exist. It's about showing that you have some value over what they're already doing. Yeah. And again, to them, they, that was intriguing insight. But to me, it's marketing 101. Uh, if you don't know how to talk to your own customer base, uh, so there's a big problem. And so anyway, what I told them was that there's got to be some message. You made me a lot of it. Um, we, we have to tell them clearly and succinctly and quickly why they should consider making a phone call right now mm -hmm. instead of tossing it in the garbage. Um, uh, again, you can't, uh, companies can't just say, here we are. Um, you got to say, here we are, uh, here's why you should engage with us. And so that was the advice I gave them was we need some copy. We need to tell them something. We need to tell them something exciting, something beneficial, something they haven't seen before. And so uh, they were pretty excited about that. But uh, uh, to me, kind of scratching my head why they don't know that already. So what did you tell them that was exciting about GE Insurance? Uh, I can't remember the specifics, but there were certain things they had, yeah. uh, some different perks of their programs that a lot of other carriers didn't have, mm -hmm. and, but they didn't tell them about them. That was the thing. We brought those to the forefront. Um, again, so many companies competing, you've got to be able to explain what's different, better, unique about what you have rather than just saying we're, we're just much the same. Um, people don't want the same because then they're happy with what they've already got. Yeah. So just helping them uh, accentuate the, the differences in what they're offering. Yeah, I mean, from reading your site and doing research, I find obviously you do tons of research. So what's, you know, I think that's also valuable. It finds like you find those deep-seated things that you need to put in the copy. What's your method for doing research when you have a company like GE coming on board? You know, my, something like that, uh, the best research is myself. 
I've got a, I've got a home. I've got cars. I've got health insurance. I I pay lots of insurance. I'm an insurance customer, right. and I know the pains of being an insurance customer. We all hate paying it, but none of us dare be without it. Right. And so, um, you know, to to get me to change insurance companies is a giant hassle for anybody. It involves a lot of paperwork. You got to usually jump through hoops to get rid of your old insurance company. And so to show up and say, hey, you should ch switch to me, it's like, man, you, you better give me a really good reason to switch because it's going to take up a lot of time and be a, a big hassle for me. So make it good. You know, show them, give me your presentation. Um, and so in that case, the research is just me. What, what would it take to get me to switch insurance companies? What would I tell myself? What could my good friend who's an insurance agent come in and say to me to get me to even budge? Um, and to me, that's just kind of a psychological human nature research, uh, as opposed to working on, uh, you know, a, a natural supplement where I'm, you know, combing through, uh, um, you know, WebMD looking for studies and research and, and things to back up claims I have. And so it just really depends. A lot of time I can insert myself as a research subject. Sometimes mm -hmm. I can't. Um, sometimes it's just a knowledge of having sold to a certain uh, crowd for a long time. Mm -hmm. And we'll talk about some of those you know, specific examples, but uh, I always like to include a fun fact. And you have a number of good fun facts, actually. You speak fluent Chinese. And you have five children, which is remarkable. You, it looks like you have all your hair. I don't know how that's possible with five kids. Um, <laughs> and you're an adrenaline junkie. First Correct. of all... Why Chinese? Uh, so I spent two years in Hong Kong. I lived there from uh, 1988 to 1990 as a church missionary. Oh, wow. So uh, you don't have a choice. If you want to speak to anyone, you got to jump in with both feet in the fire. And uh, so by the time I left, I spoke uh, about as well as they did just because I spoke it every day. Um, so, so fluent in Chinese, I would say was fluent in Chinese. It's yeah. probably still there. I've been back. It's a little rusty, but uh, that's impressive. In two years, I don't, I don't think I'd be able to actually learn the language in two years. But it's, it's, it's not as bad as you think if if you're immersed in it. Um, yeah. and, and there was some training beforehand for a couple months, but mm -hmm. yeah, it's uh, it's a lot easier to learn a language when you when you dropped into it. So, how is it running a business and then having five kids and a wife, uh, obviously? Yeah, it's it's not bad. I mean, so I work from home. Yeah, uh, my my office is not easy to get to. You you got to walk for a while through my house and through into my house again to get really? to work. Yeah. So if you want to find me, it takes a while to get here. So largely they leave me alone. Um, my wife wants to speak to me. She texts me. She emails me. She calls me from my house. Um, so it's really separated, even though it's in your house. Uh, it's in my house, but yeah, it's it's uh, it's a ways away, and so it's I, I love it. I I call it uh, semi retirement because I'm free to walk away and do it. I mean, I'm, I've got deadlines. I've got clients who are itchy to have my work. They they, they paid me. They're looking for it, um, but my days are free form. You know, I can be here and not be here as long as I manage my time well. Yeah. Um, I, I love it. I, I love working this way to not miss the important things my kids are doing, yeah. be able to spend time with my family and do the things I enjoy, not have uh, a nine to five schedule get in my way. Yeah. So, what have you learned from your kids that's helped you with your marketing? Hmm. Man. Uh, you know, so, <laughs> this is a this is a funny thought that came to mind that I, I, I say often to clients is. Yeah. A lot of companies are, and I'll tell you why this is true in a second, a lot of companies are so caught up in telling their would-be customers what they want to tell them instead of telling them what they want to hear. And there's a big difference. Um, if you set an agenda and say, this is what we must tell our potential clients, um, rather than what what do we think would we could say to them to make them understand. And I found that my dealing with my kids is much the same way when I want something from my kids I want them to do something or I need them to do something the way in which I talk to them 
if you reverse engineer it, um, instead of telling them what you want them to do to somehow make it uh, sound like something that appeals to them, it works for them. Right. And so I, my kids range, you know, from age 21 down to seven. So I've got a, a college kid and a first grader. Um, so different levels of conversation happening there. But uh, yeah. that is a that is a universal thing. The, the way you say things has a big impact on the response you get. Yeah. So what was one lately conversation with your kids where you had to customize the messaging to get them to uh, act or do something that you need them to do? You know, just, just just yesterday, yeah. I uh, we have a hot tub and and it's near a sandbox, and so there's all this sand in the bottom of my hot tub. I don't want to drain it just to get it out. So I've been looking for uh, some kind of thing to get it out of there. <clears throat> so I purchased this thing. It's called like a grit getter. Came yesterday in the mail. My son I could see you writing copy for this grit getter, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's awesome. So he came down and then my, my, my 12 year old, and he's like, you know, Dad, what is this? And so he opened it up and I said, oh, it's for the hot tub. And um, so he was going to walk away. Um, you know, go upstairs, and I said, "Hey, um, you want to use this?" He's like, "I don't know. <laughs> what, what does it do?" I'm like, "It gets the stuff off." But no, if not, I'll just do it later. But I think it's pretty cool. And uh, it wasn't uh, five minutes later; he was downstairs in his bathing suit, ready to uh, jump in the hot tub. And and so it's something I was gonna have to do. Um, but the the right. more I kind of gave it to him, and started pulling it away. You know, like, yeah, I'll do it if you don't want to do it. All of a sudden, the kid who doesn't usually love the hot tub was in it doing work for me. And uh, so it worked. Nice. And, Stephen, adrenaline junkie. So what's the craziest thing you ever did? Uh, well, the, the craziest thing I did was probably the stupidest thing I did. All right, let's uh, hear it. And, and it wasn't a thing. It, 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 was a, it, was a, it was a week. So last winter, I broke my leg. So I, mm. I, I'm a big uh, uh, water skier, wakeboarder in the summer. I'm usually on my boat when I'm not working. In the winter, I snowboard. Um, I got a lake 10 minutes and a, a mountain about 30 minutes. Um, I broke my leg in December. Wow. And uh, I told my doctor, I, I am missing snowboard season, and then I'm not happy. And uh, so I ended up uh, in, a, in a, a brace and then a cast and then a boot. Um, he went, I went into the doctor and he said, uh, all right, I'm, I'm going to, I'm supposed to be in the boot for three weeks after two, I couldn't stand it. And I went in and he, he said, okay, actually I already taken the boot off early. Um, he said, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't touch a snowboard early, do anything for a month. I said, thank you doctor for your care. You've been great. I waited, uh, I waited two days. Before I strapped my snowboard on, went back up the mountain. Oh my god! Um, that same week, I also went skiing, oh. and then I went snowshoeing. Then I went for a twenty-mile bike ride, and, and my wife was not happy, but I was determined to to prove to myself that this thing was healed and uh, not going to break on me again. What gives and you so, that? Yeah. What did it? What did, gives me that? I yeah. can't have a hard time sitting still. I, I'm not a good patient, so for a month. I basically was out of commission sitting on the couch and uh, pent up energy. So for a guy like me to just sit and watch killing me. So uh, despite the pain and the stiffness and the fact that I could barely move it, I was just so ready to go move and uh, do stuff again. And so, but it didn't break. It, it held through all that. Okay. I thought you were going to say you broke it again. So that's No, that's what everybody told me. They said, you're going to break it again. And uh, out of spite, I showed them. <laughs> we'll never know if they re-x-rayed it's probably broken that's right right so you know what's one thing steven that someone can do to improve their copy or what's some you know big uh, mistake common mistake you see people making they can improve right away uh, you know, it's a lot of the projects I work on, they, they fall into a few different categories. They're, they are uh, somebody put something together and, and it didn't work at all. Or there's the new product from scratch. We've never done this before. Um, or I guess uh, C would be we did this, 
we don't know if it's going to work, but we're afraid to throw money behind it until we have had a professional look at it. Right. Um, <clears throat> and and mo more often than not, when, when if you take away anything that's new, and so I'm taking it from scratch, it's going to be good. But I do get that stuff that's in some sort of transition, been put together on some level. Um, and most often, I think it just lacks any spark. It doesn't it lacks any creativity, any uniqueness, any anything that says, "Hey, read me." Um, like just the other day, somebody sent me a link for a website. They they are a software company. They just spent like ten grand fixing their website, um, but they <clears throat> were telling me that on their website they get like forty five hundred visitors a month. And they get about three conversions, three people who want to know more. And I said, listen, you realize that's a, a really big problem, right? And that's what keep me up at night if it was my business. Yeah. You're getting thousands of people coming to your website, looking at it, people who need what you have because it's pretty specialized. Yeah. And they're saying, no, no, I, I'm not seeing what I need here. And they're walking away. Um, and why is that? It's because... Uh, the, the people who put it together were not thinking like a marketer. They were thinking like a web guy or an IT guy or not even an IT guy. They're thinking like someone who just didn't think about what they were trying to accomplish. Um, there was no real call to action. They didn't tell them what they wanted to do. Uh, <clears throat> click open the website and the first thing you see is the name of the company. Well, the name of the company happens to have nothing to do with the product. It's not telling at all. It could be for a thousand different things. Um, and then there's no headline. It doesn't say anything. It does, right. I, uh, uh, <clears throat> a visitor can't look at it and say, oh, I know what they do, and I see what they do better, and I see why I need them. They've answered my question immediately. Um, and I think that's true of a lot of marketing. It, it's just information. Um, it, it's got to be a little bit pushy. And it's mm -hmm. got to be a little bit aggressive, and it's got to speak to the reader and a lot of it just, uh, it's there or it's kind of there, but that's why they hire me is to put a really sharp point in that stick where it's just kind of dull when, they, when they've left it. Yeah. So what did you tell them and did they actually listen to you? Oh, yeah. They, they said they agreed with everything I said. The, the problem is, uh, well, not a problem. It's not a problem for, for me, but they don't know what to do. So, yeah, now that I've pointed out to I've, I've put on their glasses, their marketing glasses, and they say, you're right we're not communicating at all. Um, so now they need to, so it, you know, I often think about what I do in terms of like a, a piece of clay and it, you know, on that potter's wheel and it's just got to be shaped and moved and twisted and, and curved just the right way to get it perfect. Um, and so to me, you, you throw me a document like that, you know, say let's, let's take it and it's just massaging, moving, bending, twisting, changing, editing just to get it to the way it needs to be, um, which is something that instantly connects with the person that's reading it. Yeah. And um, so while I know it needs to be done, now they can see it doing it's another another uh, item. Well, that's where you come into play, right? Correct. Yeah. That's what that for. Um, so what about, are there any uh, instances you can think of maybe in the health, you have a lot of health companies you've worked with where you go and maybe they have a messaging, but it doesn't really match what should be there. Sure, all the time. Yeah, um, I just redid something, in fact, for a testosterone product that uh, was heavy on research. Um, it, it talked a lot about studies, which are important. It talked about the scientific, uh, you know, the, the 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 biology and the chemistry of the ingredients of the product, and it talked about the studies that had been done, and it talked about what happens to a man who's losing their testosterone. But the, the thing that it missed was any anything that showed some empathy for the guy reading it. You know, like, you know, you got this guy, maybe he's a middle-aged guy, and he's not feeling great, and he's kind of losing muscle, and he's gaining weight, and he can't figure out what's happening to him. And it's like going up and, you know, putting your arm around him and say, hey, buddy, I know how you feel. Um, I, I, I know exactly what's happening to you. You're not alone. It happens to everybody. Um, you know, lucky, luckily, there's pretty, a pretty easy answer for it. Um, and you don't even have to go to a doctor for it. You know, mm -hmm. like, maybe you should consider 
uh, you know, this, rather than saying, hey, sir, um, let me tell you the biology of what's happening to your body right. and the chemistry behind the product they have. They, they, they want some empathy. Right. They want someone who understands what they feel yeah. like every day. Yeah. Uh, and so, that's you know, a great that, that's, point. Yeah. it's very important to get in stride with that person and, and uh, you know, uh, let them know that you understand how they feel. Yeah. That makes perfect. Like when you say that, I think people must just, they're in their own bubble and they're like, let's just talk about the science or whatever. But if you're actually, like you said, if you're actually talking to a human being next to you, you wouldn't talk like that. Right. Yeah. And that's exactly it. Is that the way somebody taught me a lot of years ago is that good copywriting is like a conversation in anticipating what they're thinking too. So you can speak to the things on their mind. And, yeah. um, so, you know, a, a good, uh, a good content writer, a good technical writer, can put together a mail piece, but a good marketer makes it personal. That yeah. they, they they show they understand um, what they're going through. Yeah. And Steve, it's not always easy to figure out. I think what are people thinking, like on a deeper level. And you talk about this on your site. Is there an instance that you remember where it surprised you when you were doing your research that really surprised you that people actually their deep seated thoughts for maybe it's a health product or maybe a financial product, that this is their deep-seated, the way they're thinking? You know, I don't, I don't get that because I don't, <clears throat> I don't see that into the business. But where I do get some insight is I have clients who love to jump on the phone. That They'll sit in their office, they'll put on a headset, and they'll plug into their call center. Um, and they'll listen to the calls mm. coming in. Yeah. And conversations that they're... Uh, you know, salespeople are having, especially with the supplement crowd, because they're seniors, they're wary, but they're also falling apart, and they they want to feel better, and they want to have hope in these products. Yeah. That they they do want some relief, they do want to feel young again. So they've got questions, and they're smart. Um, they're a lot smarter consumer than they used to be. Yeah. And so, you know, Mike, <clears throat> sometimes. If there seems to be a disconnect somewhere, I'll ask my clients, you know, what what are you hearing on the phone? And they'll mm. say, well, you know, they're 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 telling me that they took something similar and it didn't help, or they they've seen this ingredient before and they're not sure what to do with it, or they're not sure it, it's working. Um, and sometimes they'll give me some insight, or you know, sometimes these people will stay on the phone for a long time. And, uh, and tell them about their complaints. You know, I wake up in the morning and I, I, it takes me 45 minutes to get out of my bedroom because my knees are so locked up. Yeah. And uh, this has been the best thing. Sometimes I'll call just to tell them it's a great product. Oh, nice. But, you know, it, it's, it's hard for me to know, I mean, except from some of that feedback. Yeah. Uh, but, but a lot of it's just common sense. I know old people. Um, I know what they're going through. I... Uh, <laughs> You're not old yet. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not. I'm not quite there yet. But um, you know, I, I know. I know what a lot of them are going through. I mean, the the health is a number of what concern. Finances is a concern. Yeah. Uh, some of the relationships with their family as they get older are a concern. Yeah. You know, when you're selling financial products. So there's a lot of things that I just happen to know because I've paid attention. Yeah. And good copywriters are good observers of life. Yeah. And uh, I'm one of those guys who likes to sit. And sometimes eavesdrop and just yeah. listen to people's conversations as they go by and uh, pick up a lot of insight that way. Yeah. There's one case in particular I remember you uh, reading is um, after your first job and you were on the bus and you were supposed to write a financial piece. That's right. What did the, well, tell people what, uh, what were you doing? What did you hear? Man, I can't remember the, the details, but, uh, I, I, yeah, I was I was chasing my first job out of college, and I'd been to an interview in downtown Salt Lake, and and my car was sold. I was afraid to drive it, so I took the bus. And he had given me an assignment. Um, Peter Harrison, who hired me, he uh, the assignment was to and I can't remember what it was about. It was it was some kind of financial thing. Um, can't remember if it was insurance or some kind of investment or or a banking. Anyway. Um, 
I'd never, I'd never really written a mail package before. I, the, the direct marketing concept was new to me, even though I got a degree in advertising. Um, they never covered direct marketing. So all of a sudden I was talking to a guy who was a direct marketer. But yeah, I got on that bus with that assignment. And, uh, and there, lo and behold, these two guys, these two old guys, were sitting there having a conversation about the very thing I'd just been tasked to write. Mm. And so I just sat and uh, gloried in this conversation because this is, I thought, this is great. And uh, I listened to the things they talked about. And I immediately went home and started banging stuff out on my uh, keyboard because I thought, this is golden. This is what these guys actually think. And at the time, I was like 23, 24. I didn't even know any old people. My parents weren't even old yet. Um, and so to... Uh, to, to to wander on into that uh, fortuitous situation like mm-hmm. that was what was kind of cool. What do you do now to mimic that? To hear the real conversation. You know, it just depends. I I, I do sell a lot to this uh, elderly crowd, the seniors of America, the baby boomers. There there's millions of them, and they're they've got a lot of financial buying power, and a lot of my clients key into that, and so. When it comes to supplements, financial products, yeah. uh, hearing aids, um, you know, uh, other kind of investments, uh, coin, collectible coins, walk-in mm-hmm. bathtubs, um, I, I feel like I know that typical American senior really, really well. I've read hundreds of their testimonials for so many different products. Uh, I see the things that they're going through, what they're up against. I see my parents, my in-laws. You know, they're, they're in that group. They're 70 yeah. something years old. I know the worries they have because I listen to them. My, my in-laws come over once a month and I just sit and listen to them talk about their health problems, about the, the financial concerns they have, about the things they like and don't like and how they can't move around much anymore. Um, you know, they're, they're looking at the uh, end game, you know, they're, they're, they're uh, you know 10, 20 years from from being done, and it's a different mindset that you and I have. Um, but they're still got buying power. My clients want to sell them things, and uh, so I just a lot of times I think about my in laws. You know uh, what what would get their attention? They're pretty typical American seniors. Um, you know they're they're patriotic. They're they're loving. They're that greatest generation. I mean they're they're awesome people. And uh, I'm just curious so I, what your process is like. Let's say you get a health, a health company and you want to sell the seniors. You can't just get on the bus and ride it back and forth to you over here, a health conversation. Do you, no. um, or what do you suggest other people do? Do you, do you say, call all the people you know over this age group or do you go on certain websites to research? You know, when it comes to health supplements, I've written so many of them. Yeah. I mean, literally hundreds and hundreds of them for every ailment you can imagine. I mean, everything. And some you can't. Um, there's nothing I haven't written for. And so I, I kind of know. What um, was the supplement that you remember thinking there's an actual supplement for this? Uh, I don't even know if I if I dare say this, um, but well, I mean, it's, it's no secret, but there is a new product and, uh, it, it's derived from cannabis and, uh, and, but it's, it's got a great health value. It's the, uh, so if, if you take a hemp plant and, and break it down chemically, you end up with THC and something called, I can't remember, it's called, uh, CBD and the THC is what, uh, gives you a, a, a fun fun effect and the CBD is, is what is medicinally helps calm anxiety mm. and uh, I, think, I think it was good for uh, pain, joint pain and inflammation. Mm-hmm. Um, I thought I knew everything but this only came to me a couple weeks ago and I was surprised that and I, you know, lo and behold, it's already out there, it's already being marketed and, and people like it. Um, so is, it all, is it legal in certain states or? It's legal in every state in the United States. Really, um, to to be sold as a supplement. Wow, there is no uh, no no uh, ill effect, but you know sometimes you know people will come up with, and, that, and that's the thing. And my clients are always looking for new and different. Um, I'm working on an arthritis project right now for something called Chokeberry. Uh, I had not heard of it. Uh, young t- 
tissue extract for something I used for a testosterone um, booster. And so my clients are out there scouring the world looking for stuff that somebody else doesn't have, but, yeah. but that again is backed by studies. Um, it's got to work. Yeah. And so I, I come across uh, all kinds of crazy stuff. That is interesting. Yeah, you could use that as a parenting one. You slip in your kid's food to calm them. You could. Well, <laughs> It, it, that's that's part of what they do. The medicinal uh, marijuana is uh, is this is this very same product, and uh, it, I, I think you're probably going to see a lot more of it as people. Yeah, that's interesting. It. It's okay. So, Steve, I want to hear about how you got started in copywriting, because it's also an interesting story. Um, yeah. So, it, actually, it happened when I was seven years old. I, I broke my jaw. Fell off my bike, slammed my jaw into the ground, Jeez. Um, broke it, put my put my teeth through my top lip, almost oh. bit, bit my tongue off. Went to the doctor, uh, had some had some surgery. Um, for whatever reason, I decided at that point in my life I was going to be a doctor. Hmm. So from from seven to fourteen, I told everybody I want to be a doctor, and I really did. I, I part of me still does wish I was a doctor, um, but as I got older. You know, I, I think I realized I did not love school. It wasn't my favorite thing to do. Um, and uh, but nevertheless, my plan was always to be a doctor. And uh, when I was 14, um, my mom came home from the library with a book called Ogilvy and Advertising. He had just he had just written it. Uh, David Ogilvy, one of the great copywriters of the world, you know, started Ogilvy and made her. Um, she said, Stephen, I think you'd be a good copywriter. I didn't even know what that was. I'd How did she know what that was? I don't know. It's a good question. I think she just must have seen something in me, uh, some creativity, some uh, mm -hmm. something that she thought I'd like it. So I took this book. It was full of pictures and ads and uh, David, David's uh, philosophy behind writing copy. And you know, he had written some of the early ads for Rolls Royce and Rolex and um, the really classic stuff, but was good. And I read it, and I changed uh, professions on the spot. Wow! I said I'm going to be a copywriter, and uh, wow, that's crazy. And so, I, even though college applications, I put uh, I put lawyer, marine biologist, uh, medical school, but really, I knew I was going to be a copywriter. So I went to school, got a degree in advertising. Um, got out of school and realized that nobody wants to hire a guy who says he's a copywriter out of college. And uh, I banged on doors and banged and banged and begged and uh, did anything I could and finally uh, offered to work for free. Oh, really? I told, I told Peter Harrison that I would work for free if he would just give me the experience because I went to interview. I went on a lot of interviews, and they said you, you're very talented, but we don't need a copywriter. We're kind of full. Um, Peter didn't need one either, but he said you're the you're the most talented guy I've ever had in here looking for a job. Wow. But I don't really need a copywriter. And I said, Peter, I need a job. I have a wife. I have a baby. I, I'm ready to start, but I need somewhere to go. And yeah. so I said, uh, my my in-laws owned an apartment in downtown Salt Lake, an apartment building. Uh, I said I'll work. I'll, I'll live there for free. So I said I'll, I'll do it for free. I actually sent him a letter with a bandaid on it and told him that um, you know him telling me I w was good. He hired me to do a couple of test projects, one of which was the one from the bus. Um, and I said I don't need a bandaid. I need a job. And uh, he said you know I I just I couldn't resist. I couldn't I couldn't let you go. Um, and so he paid me a thousand dollars a month. He said, I won't let you work for free. And as soon as you prove yourself and, and beat out the other copywriter, I'll double your salary. Mm. So within about three months, I had written an ad that beat out the veteran that was in the agency mm -hmm. and, uh, and he doubled my salary and that's how I started. But like I said, I, I knew nothing about direct response marketing. Had never heard of it. Didn't know what it was until he, uh, showed me. And uh, I was on my way. What was it that you did that he recognized that you're one of the most talented people that they interviewed? Um, you know, he, he, he uh, they had, um, they had a sweepstakes client at the time, and I don't, I don't remember who it was, but he said something to me like, you know, what do you know about sweepstakes? 
and I said, I've only opened them and I like them. I love them because they're like a circus in an envelope. <laughs> it is. And he laughed at me. And he, he said to me later, you know, you made that comment. And I thought that was the perfect, succinct, uh, ex, you know, description of what a sweepstakes is. And then there was the letter I'd written him, the, the Band-Aid letter with the Band-Aid That's on That's very it. clever. It said, uh, yeah. you know, I don't need your money. And actually, I offered to give him the money back that he paid me to write those packages. And uh, I said, I don't need your money. I, I need a job. And, uh, and, then, and then third was, I said, I'll do it for free. And he said, not all combined together. Uh, it wasn't going to let me walk away. Hmm. What made you think of putting a Band-Aid on a letter? Because I, I guess at the time I just thought in terms of uh, you know when, to, when when there's a problem in life there's band aids and there's solutions and a band aid is is a short term solution that's going to come off yeah. um, and I don't like band aid solutions sometimes you you need them but I was thinking in terms of uh, I want a permanent solution to my problem which was I needed a job yeah. uh, I didn't need a little bit of cash from him I needed long term employment and training more than anything I needed him to teach me yeah. uh, you know and, and direct response has been something that's so well suited to my personality rather than um, general advertising which was what I wanted to do I wanted to go work for Coke and Nike and put up cool billboards and make advertisements that people saw during the Super Bowl but then when I saw the light and realized that there's a much better harder hitting profitable yeah. um, you know, and uh, I can't think of the word, uh, you know, a better way to spend your advertising dollars. Yeah. Accountable is what I was looking for. Once I saw that, there was no looking back. Yeah. Um, I knew direct, direct marketing was for me. Yeah. So what did you learn from, uh, from Peter? Uh, I learned a lot from Peter. Um, he, would, he was my mortal enemy until I left there. How so? Uh, Oh, I didn't like him. Uh, we're, we're good friends now, um, but I had a hard time working for him. He he, he was uh, a, a veteran of tough love, a believer in tough love. Mm. I remember one time he he came into my office with something that I had written. He, he took the paper, looked at me, purposely crumpled it up, crumpled it up while he kept eye contact and threw it on my floor, my office floor, and said. Don't ever give me crap like that again. <laughs> it didn't, didn't tell me what was wrong with it. Didn't tell me what I did wrong. Well, didn't tell me what needed to be fixed. That is tough love. He's, that's all he said. Um, and so I had to scramble to figure it out myself. Another time he looked at me. We were going over some copy. He said, he said you're being lazy. Don't ever be lazy or I'll fire you. And, uh, you know, when, when I worked so hard to get the job and I'm, I'm still young and out of school, and I realized he was right. I was being lazy. Clients aren't paying me to be lazy. They're paying me to take the extra time to, to get it right and then to see if I can get it even more right. Um, and so he, he taught me the, uh, you know, the art of words, how to, how to use as few as possible to get your point across, mm -hmm. how to be conversational, how to uh, write the way people talk rather than how you might write a book or, or um, you know, People will say that to me. Just recently, I was working for a, a realtor in Manhattan that sells multi-million dollar condos and homes. And, and he said, he starts pointing out typos, or not, not typos, but grammatical stuff. And I, I said, uh, Mark, that's not how we talk. If, if you're going to start pointing out everything that you think is grammatically wrong, grammatically wrong we're, gonna, we're never going to get anywhere. Um, you know, I write the way people talk, and he said, I get it, I get it, I see it, mm -hmm. okay, never mind. And um, Peter taught me that. He said, that's the way we should write, is the way people talk. Yeah. It helps them get through it a lot easier. Yeah. So what other valuable advice do you still think back on like that? From uh, Peter? Fr from Peter? Yeah. Hmm. Um, you know, he had, oh man, I can't remember if I still have it. Somewhere I do, there was a... Oh, I remember it was because it was in Seinfeld. Jay Peterman, you know, Jay Peterman. Yeah, is, yeah, the Jay Peterman um, catalog from Seinfeld. Right, yeah. Jay Peterman catalog. He made me sub. Well, I didn't have to subscribe. Yeah, well, he made me sign up for the Jay Peterman catalog. Okay. Uh, 
he said, this is some of the best writing in the world right now. Wow. And uh, so every month I got that catalog. It was kind of fancy. It had almost kind of a linen color. And everything in there was, uh, you know, if you ever watch Seinfeld, Elaine used to work for Jay Peter, but uh, he was always off finding this crazy stuff to make uh, clothes out of. And so he said, it, he said, if you read this, it will help you be a better writer. And, and just, just the fact that it was all, you know, well, it was pretty short copy. Sometimes they devoted page to a product, but, um, you know, he, he taught me that, you know, just because we're direct marketers doesn't mean we have to, uh, you know, use, use overly fancy words or complicated words or, or very simple words, you know, and, uh, so anyway, I still have my J. Peter Herman catalog somewhere. You don't have it. it. Yeah, you don't have it within reach uh, now. I'm trying to remember where it is. Um, no, I thought it was. Uh, I thought it was on my shelf here, but I don't think it is. Oh yes, it is. There we go. Let's see. Fall of 1994. <laughs> my J. Peter Herman catalog, and uh, it's great stuff. I didn't even realize it was an actual real catalog. I just thought it was a character on Seinfeld. Oh, yeah. No, if you can uh, see it, you know, the, the universal language of Blazer, and he says, 10 a.m. Wednesday, March 16th, Curzon Street. And he starts talking, starts telling a story about this. Uh, this. It's great stuff. You know, there's, a, there's always a story. Um, so anyway, yeah, that was, uh, that was Peter's. Nice. Peter's inspiration. So did you have any other mentors in your career? Uh, you know, after I worked for Peter, I went to a guy. Peter fired me. He told me he was going to. He uh, said, I'm going to give you a year. He gave me a year and a half, and he fired me and told me it was time for me to move on. Again, tough love. It is tough love, yeah. Nothing, nothing personal. He said, I, just, I told you you were going to have to go, and now it's time. And so wow. I went to work for a guy named uh, Mike Pavlish in Ohio. I worked for him for uh, about eight and a half years. Oh, wow. um, I learned from Mike a, a different style of direct response copywriter, where Peter was uh, more uh, flourished, uh, polished writing. Mike taught me the art of uh, banging them over the head until they hand you their money, <laughs> which, is a, which is a little crass. But uh, like, give me really an example crazy. of that. What do you mean by that? Um, you know, it, it was just very hard hitting, very aggressive. Um, I think I've found a happy meeting. You, you can't always yell at people. You can't use lots of exclamation points and, 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 and uh, coerce them into doing something they don't want to. But he showed me that there's a you know, universe of, cop of direct response copywriting that is very aggressive and uh, very hard hitting and, and very kind of raw. And so I went from uh, you know, the, the, the guy in the suit and tie to the guy, you know, in uh, you know, an open shirt and a cup of coffee in his hands, and and uh, I learned from, um, you know, I, I think I think um, Mike taught me somewhat more about the psychology of the reader than I you know learned from Peter was more about the writing, um, uh, Mike was more about the people you know you know what what's going to resonate with them. Yeah. So what was one of those hard hitting pieces that you remember? An example uh, of one of them that you worked on that would, you would consider hitting someone over the head or hard hitting or more in your face? You know, there was uh, something I did called uh, the Highlander Club for a, for a company called Agora. They're still around, very big. Um, they're all kind of multifaceted uh, drug marketing company. Um, but I wrote a piece for them called the Highlander Club that uh, they mailed for years. They, they made a fortune with it. Um, but uh, it's not, not, not one of the proudest things I ever wrote, but it was for people who needed a moral boost. Yeah. They needed to feel like they could succeed. They needed, a, they needed a home and a family and a friend and somewhere they could sit down and feel like they're accomplishing something. And they've got like-minded individuals to do that with. And that was the Highlander Club. It was about money and success and confidence and uh, achievement and uh, camaraderie, um, but it was pretty coercive. It was pretty, uh, you know, what else have you got? Where else are you going to go? Who else is going to love you like we do? 
Um, who else is going to give you money like we do? Who else is going to do this? And um, it was nothing fancy. It was uh, it was not um, you know it, it wasn't pretty. It, it wasn't um, you know the finest copywriting, but it was what hit that market. These are you know working class guys who, who needed a friend, and uh, you know and it, it did really really well. They yeah. they built it for years, made a fortune with it. What so? What else? With go ahead. I say I never would have gotten, I never would have written that as well had I gotten a project from Peter Harrison. Right. It was after working for Mike that I learned how to write that way. That sometimes, even though you're not maybe in their same class or their same financial situation or their same walk of life, um, that doesn't mean you can't get down or, or you know bring them up or meet on a stool at the same level and say hey, let's have a conversation. Let me see how I can help you. Yeah. What else was memorable in those times with with Mike that you were what what other project was memorable? Hmm. Uh, I I, I know we're that's... talking about an eight year span. <laughs> and that and that was ten, twelve years ago that it was the end of the span. You know, we, we did a lot of the things Mike Mike helped me, you know, a lot of copywriters they they're able to focus on a lot of time. There is one thing. There's a lot of them that only write financial. A lot of them only write health. A lot of them that only write sweepstakes. Um, from Mike, and this is not the answer to your question, but what he gave me was a very well-rounded uh, portfolio in a lot of different things. I learned how to become a very good health writer. I learned how to become a very good financial writer. I've written thousands of sweepstakes. Um, I could write anything because of Mike because I never knew it was going to come across my desk. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, again, I wrote hundreds of projects while I worked for Mike, and they were all over the place, very, very wide-ranging. Um, you know, a lot of heavy into sweepstakes and lotteries, and, yeah. which is not glamorous, yeah. but, uh, again, you got to get the job done for the client. Yeah. Tell me about the mentality behind that, because I did see on your site the publishing publisher's clearinghouse. What's one where you, what's inside someone's head that you need to get out in that circus that you, circus in the envelope? It's all about money. Who doesn't want more money? You know, I think Peter or Mike also taught me that people want three things. They want better health, more money, and more love. Um, he said almost everything fits into one of those three categories. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, obviously, the sweepstakes is is all about the dream yeah. of uh, you know a, a yacht and traveling the world on a private jet and money to do it. Which you know, realistically, most people on this earth that's not even close to their reality. Um, Publishers Clearinghouse says, "Hey, here's your shot. Doesn't cost you a dime, but you might as well take it, right? Because what have you got to lose? Someone's got to win. Someone's gonna win." Um, it could be you. We don't know unless you, you know, unless you, unless you enter. Um, you know that's what motivates people to line up and buy lottery tickets. And um, who doesn't want more money? You know, even the billionaires of the earth are looking for more money. It is uh, an uh, insatiable uh, appetite for money, especially free money. So what um what do you do to change? Because I'm sure all those things have been written about before. What do you do to make it fresh or get people to open it when they already know? what it is uh yeah it's <laughs> a good question i you know there's uh i mean I, I really have written probably over a thousand different sweeps type pieces in my life yeah. and it, it's just finding new inspiration i mean i've got papers sitting here on my desk uh you know here here's a here's a form that is a uh, pre-sale tickets for uh, concert tickets, you know, up at a ski resort. I might look at this and say, I think I can turn this into a sweeps, uh, you know, use it mm. as a basis for a, a new sweeps report. Um, you know, stuff from the government, I'll, I'll, I'll just start poking around until I find something new mm. that I think has never been done and, and uh, say, I think this could work. Yeah. So, uh, you know, that's uh, a good, good answer. Not a Yeah, it goes back into observing your everyday life and right. taking things that maybe don't relate and bringing them into the sweepstakes industry. Well, especially the, the government's really good at getting your attention. Yeah. Uh, 
when they want to get your attention, that the, they they know how to strike fear. Yes. Uh, and so a lot of times I'll see things uh, for whatever reason, you know, some kind of government form. They want to make sure that you got and understand. Um, I think that this is a good, this is a great format. I think uh, would would. would yes. <laughs> if it scares me, the government, I can use it for my sweepstakes. That's right. No, you said it on your site, actually, one of the qu frequently asked questions is, if you have in-house writers or marketers or whatever, why use me? And your point was, you need to bring someone from the outside who sees what you can't see when you're just in your bubble, you know? Right. Yeah. And I did yeah, get... I, all what's that? It happens all the time. With, uh, they tell me that they're in-house people or they don't know what to say anymore. Mm -hmm. And... And so it, it is helpful because I see, you know, 10 different things across my desk in any given month. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it I can, you know, use for different things. You know, one idea over here and another idea I can pull from over here for this guy. And Yeah. What was one of those that you could talk about? Like I know, I forgot who it was, the electronics company who used the, uh, you know, the plug that's magnetic because some other company used the plug that's magnetic so it doesn't you know, tip the whole electronics over, maybe it was Apple or someone else. What was one of those ideas that you took from one industry and used it for another? Um, you know, I had a client who was uh, selling um, skin cream in a self mailer, a little packet, um, a free sample. And, uh, you know, they, they, they were including the free sample and I thought that that's great. And another client, who was uh, trying to sell a detox foot pad, um, you know, uh, again, flat, thin, um, perfect, you know, to go in a, you know, in the sample. And, uh, you know, so I said, hey, there, there's this idea, uh, same, you know, different product, we could use the same format, same idea, and it, of course it did very well. Nice. So what was next after Mike, working with Mike, what was the next big milestone? Uh, then I went into business with a partner. We started a marketing company. Um, it, it was more of a. It was. It was a good time for me because I felt like I had been burned out. I've been writing copy then for about ten years. Um, I kind of thought, you know, I think I have some some more marketing expertise to share. Um, I had some some guys I knew who were looking to start a marketing firm, and uh, what they didn't have was a creative piece of it, and so. After uh, you know, it took a while for me to walk away, and uh, you know I was leaving behind a pretty well-paying job, yeah. a lot of freedom, a lot of vacation time, you know all the perks of working for somebody. But what I didn't have is uh, my freedom to have my own business, and so this gave me the opportunity to walk away. Yeah. It was kind of a, a risk because I was walking to an unknown. Yeah. We didn't have a lot of clients or a lot of money, but um, but it was a, an opportunity for me to get out. To, to stop and walk away and so and anyway, we started a marketing firm um, I, I learned that I don't always play well with others um, how many and, kids did you have at that point uh, four probably mm -hmm. I think my, so it's not an easy my, thing to do walk away from that with four oh, kids I, I and took a substantial salary cut um, but you know it, it it led to, we, we were not overly successful. We had a hard time landing clients. We found out that uh, the small businesses of the world do not really have the money or want to spend the money on something. Even though they need it, they know they need it, they don't want to buy it. So about a year into that, uh, I started writing copy again. I started looking for direct response, uh, you know, mailing companies. And uh, I found out that, that they won, wanted me too. And so all of a sudden I was very busy writing direct response copy all day and kind of had him running the marketing side of it, the, the marketing business. Um, and at some point I just realized that um, you know what I had with him was not going to work long term. We just had differences of opinion. We weren't getting the clients we needed. Um, but meanwhile I was I was gaining a lot of success. You know, I was tucked away in an agency with Mike Pavlich for all those years. Nobody knew who I was. I was doing a lot of the work, but no one knew who, who right. I was. You're an anonymous, so, yeah. Right, so all of a sudden I started getting my name out. You know, I'm the guy that used to work for Mike. And uh, and I said, okay, yeah, I, I know you. Um, and I, I became very busy. 
and at some point I um, just had a talk with him and we, we ended our relationship and I went on and just uh, went off as a, a freelance writer. Yeah. So what were some of the big memorable milestones with your freelance? Um, like any certain clients or packages that you that you think back on? Uh, no, I mean, there were a lot of companies that I knew. I knew a lot of people. Um, I knew who they were and knew what they did, and I just started reaching out to them um, just to get things going. But, uh, you know, I, you talk about you know people who come along at a at a certain time, and there's a uh, you know list broker in New York called Macromark, and a guy there named Dave Klein, and Dave had just taken over uh, Macromark, and some I had just written a mail package for a guy that they were doing the data for, um, and Dave got my package, and uh, he started telling other people when someone said, "Hey, I need a copyright," he started giving out my name. I had no clue who Dave was. Um, but people, he started saying, call, call Stephen Kimball, call Stephen Kimball. And all of a sudden, I'm getting inundated with calls from people who want stuff. And they're all saying, Dave Klein sent me. I'm like, I, I got to figure out who Dave Klein is. Um, and so I landed a lot of great clients, some of which are still with me, you know, 10 years later. That yeah, that's got amazing. Because, uh, Dave needed someone to refer and he liked what he'd seen. Wow. And uh, that was huge for me because all of a sudden, I had just taken another risk. Um, in fact, I... I I guess I had taken a job out here with a client out here in Utah. Um, and then I gave the job back. And uh, th th there was that little twist in the story there. But uh, it, it was very uh, fortuitous right then to Dave, yeah. you know, sending me all that work when I, when I did it. Yeah, I saw that Dave's quote is on your, on your site. And it's right. funny because um, last week I chatted with Dave just, right. just randomly. Yeah. Huh? So that's so funny that uh, that he comes up. So what about one of the more uh, most successful campaigns that you look back on? Maybe one of the health ones and why it was effective, what you did with it. You know, one of the clients I work very closely with is uh, WellMed in California. Um, he developed a new product um, called Baneys. And... Uh, you know, that this country, there is a growing issue of uh, um, diabetes and lower yeah. leg neuropathy yeah. um, problems and, uh, you know, some overweight issues. And, uh, you know, he, he had noticed that a lot of his clients, a lot of his customers, uh, you know, had lower leg issues. And so he developed a formula. Uh, we put together a mailer, and he's been mailing that for... Uh, like boy, four or five years now, and uh, you know it's his number one selling product. He sold, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands, and not millions of bottles. Um, and you know, he he and I kind of pioneered that together. He, he put together the formula, I put together the mailer, and uh, it's done very very well. Um, you know, and, and it's kind of a new category. It doesn't have a lot of uh, a lot of competition with it, which is nice. Yeah. So what are, what do you think allowed it to do so well? Uh, need, the, 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 not not a lot of uh, you know if you again you know who are we talking to? Uh, generally, uh, older women they their legs are swollen and achy and uh, filled with fluid and they don't move very well and they have a hard time carrying them around. And their their veins are bulging out, and they're you know you, you think about your legs. They got a big job to do. They they got to carry you around for years, um, and when they start to go uh, south, it really affects your life. Yeah. And uh, he had seen this need that that there's a lot of people out there who have leg problems. A lot of them. There's not a lot of solutions. You can wear uh, you know support socks. You can have surgery on your veins. You can put your feet up every night and soak them. Uh, you know, you, you can try to cut back on things that you know cause inflammation in your legs. But but what there wasn't was any kind of natural solution. You know, here's some natural ingredients that have been proven to help your legs. You know, improve their health. And so, um, you know, again, it was a need that he saw and we we tapped into. Right. I mean, there's a need, but you still have to write good copy to get those people to buy. 
Because if you have just anyone write it, there could be a need and no one's going to respond. You know, so, it's just just came about a lot of conversation with him, you know, describing who these people are. Yeah. I see them. I know who they are. I know I, I, I've seen them shuffling through the grocery store, um, you know, having a tough time. Every step is a challenge. And I thought that's who we're talking to. Mm -hmm. And so when I wrote, that's what was in my mind was that person, you know, again, if I could sit down, if they needed to take a load off and they sat down on a bench and, and started telling me how their legs are just shot and I had a, a bottle of uh, veinies in my pocket and brought it out and, hey, let me, let me tell you what this can do for you. You know, I, I, see, I see your symptoms. Let me show you what, what, how this matches up with them. And, um, you know, if you get good at it, it's, it's not that hard. Mm -hmm. It takes some thinking. Mm -hmm. You have to, you know, putting yourself in the other people's shoes. Yeah. So, Stephen, what's another good uh, health one? Um, I know health resources you worked with, yeah. um, any other, what other good ones, uh, did you work with as far as the health goes? Uh, I mean, I've worked with all of them, uh, pretty much every, uh, supplement company in this country. Plus most of the ones abroad I've had as clients at one time or another. Um, you know, you, <laughs> I've written a copy for every pill, par, bar, patch, cream, <laughs> uh, you know, bottle of pills. You can name for almost every ailment you can think of, and some that you can't. Yeah. Um, Which one did so, you write? And after writing it, you started taking it because you convinced yourself so much on, on what it was. Yeah, you know, it's funny. Is uh, you, you can't see, but I have a big shelf here in my office, and it's full of stuff. Um, I've never taken any of it. Nothing. Um, nothing. I've got pills here for. Uh, potency, prostate problems, vision, hearing. <laughs> you're saving them for when you're older? <laughs> yeah, baldness, uh, you name it. I've got skin creams and hearing aids and thyroid stuff. And, I, and in fact, uh, I take thyroid medication every day because my thyroid shot. Hmm. I've got a bottle of natural thyroid uh, rejuvenator here that I've never even taken. Um, but uh, if people ask you that all the time and they say, well, why, why don't you use anything your client sends you? And, and I tell them for the simple reason that, uh, you know, knock on wood, I'm still pretty healthy. Right. Um, however, if, you know, that, that's the difference between me and people who buy supplements is they're not healthy. They have a problem. And if I was in pain every day, if I was really hurting and uncomfortable and the, my doctor had little, uh, you know, help for me absolutely i would take this stuff yeah because i do believe it works and my clients work hard to put a quality product together um but i just haven't needed it i, I I'm, I'm good or or i'm naive i don't know one or the other what about what did you do for omaha steaks because they're definitely known for doing tons of direct mail All right uh it was just a, a new test they they wanted to test a new writer uh, she had gotten my name from the president of the DMA who she said I need a new copywriter he said I know this guy uh, you know has been with us for a while and so they were looking for a test and uh, you know I, I was happy because I love steak and I love good steak and I had been a buyer of Omaha steak before mm -hmm. um, and so I was definitely in their target market which isn't always the case um, but yeah, they, they were looking, they, they test a lot, and they're always trying to see if they can come up with something just a little bit better. Yeah. Uh, and so I was, uh, that was one of those projects, again, that uh, I probably would have written for free because it was just fun to write, it, you know, uh, to, to be able to uh, put your feelings towards a good steak on paper. If you ever had a really good steak and you're passionate about it, you know how that is. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, it was a great opportunity to, to write about something that I love. So what other notable campaigns stick out to you in your career that you think back that you're, um, you think it was especially successful or got a good client response from? Uh, that's one of those tough questions. Uh, Any products, um, you know, you work with so many companies, um, I'm trying to think. I mean, like you know, like we discussed, uh, a good, a better proportion of what I write works than doesn't. 
but it's not all a home run, yeah. and it's and they know that that yeah. it's the risk we take together. Um, but I mean, I expect uh, that what I write is going to work unless they come back and tell me it hasn't. Yeah. Uh, but you know, some of my clients I've had for years, you know, 10, 15 years I've known them, um, and they keep coming back and we keep working on stuff together. So I mean, some of the big corporate clients actually are not, you know, my favorite or my most notable clients. Um, because they, they live in a different world than I do. I mean, they use direct marketing, but they, they go about it much differently than a lot of my hardcore direct response clients. Um, and so they're not always the easiest to work with. They're very complicated, lots of layers and, and permissions and, and paperwork and procedure, and, um, you know, that a lot of, that I don't always enjoy. I like the ones who just send me an email and say, hey, this is what I need. Um, send me an invoice. We don't have to talk about it. Mm. But as far as you know, what's notable? Uh, man, you know, I did some for National Geographic. That was a lot of fun. It was a, a World War II book. Um, I love World War II. I mean, mm. I think it's just a neat part of history. I loved working on that for them. They paired me with a great graphic designer. Um, we were able, they, you know, they encouraged me to get very creative with it. Mm. Um, so do you remember any of the details like headlines or some of the things you did to, uh, to put it together? I don't. I, I'd have to pull it all up and look like at it. Like what was the – why would someone buy a World War II book? What was some of the like kind of psychology – who are you selling it to? Uh, again, baby boomers. You know, mm -hmm. that they lived that. That was them. They, they, some of them were there. And so, you know, just like they have, a, you know, they have their collector series, these big thick books – uh, they've got one, you know, they sent me on the Vietnam or the Civil War, the Vietnam War. Um, so this was their book on World War II, you know, their updated version. And, uh, you know, it, it's just if you enjoy learning about World War II, it was the book to have, you know, all the, the GIs going off to war and, the, you know, Pearl Harbor and, and, you know, Nazi Germany and all this stuff. And you still have a good portion of this country who who were, you know, that was part of the life, now, not just a memory like it was, or you know, part of history like it was for me. Yeah, um, I wasn't there or, or close to it, and so um, you know, I, again, that was a lot of research. You'll know, digging around, looking at some of the archive stuff that they had dug up, and you know what was in the book, and you know, learning, educating myself about some of the aspects of the war I didn't know about. Yeah, what about? And you mentioned the. Um the things, you know, not everyone you hit a home run out of the park. What's one that didn't do well and then what you did because they come back to you and then you had to tweak a few things to actually improve it? And, you know, sometimes it, it's just a matter of uh, changing a headline, um, changing the pricing. You know, that's the thing about the position. I mean, not every, it's not always the copywriting. Um, I only control part of this puzzle. Um, I don't. I don't choose who they mail it to. Uh, I don't. Uh, I don't choose when they mail it. I don't choose the pricing structure. I don't. I don't have no control over their call center. So my job is to write the copy and get it out there. Why it doesn't work is is not always apparent. But sometimes, you know, if they get a kind of a lukewarm uh, response, sometimes that more tends to say it was part of the copy. Um, you know, I redid. Something that surprised me, you'd asked me before, uh, somebody sent me a, a mailer to be redone that had done very poorly. It was for a seminar for an uh, investment property down in Belize. And I looked at it and I thought right away, I, I could help this thing in five minutes. Um, it's so bad, so wrong, they missed so many things, um, did so many, made so many mistakes. Um, so I rewrote it. We redesigned it, worked with my designer to get it, uh, you know, just the way I envisioned it. Um, and I thought, and they were thrilled. They loved it. They're like, wow, just very impressed. Um, mailed it and found out that it didn't do well. And I, I, you know, I still shake in my head. I can't figure out Not why. Sure why. Because they got a, a decent response from the one they had that was so misleading and confusing and poorly done, right. and I did what I thought was an awesome job. Everyone agreed. Very nice. Very well done. Very well written. Uh, people didn't like it, and uh, you know that 
has not come back to me. You know, they didn't ask me to redo it again. Um, but you know, that's the kind of thing I look at. I don't know. I don't know what to change. I don't know. I don't understand because I've make it more confusing. Like, what right. do you, what do you do with it? It, it was to a, it was to a crowd of accredited investors, which is a very small, uh, slim section of this of our society. Um, I've written to them before. They're not strangers to me. Uh, you know, I know how they think. I know about their net worth and how they live and um, what they're trying to do with their money. But it didn't work, and I, I still don't know why. Yeah. Yeah. It, it is kind of mind blowing. In in you know, one other thing is some of the big mistakes people make. What are what are the most common ones? I know you have a list in your site about kind of using kind of I don't know if it's more for headlines or in general but about using specifics never use questions make the headline big and bold make it compelling captivating capture in 10 words or less avoid humor make it positive uh you know benefits what what out of those what do you think people miss the most or leave out um I see a lot of questions and the, and the reason why I was taught never to use questions is because you can't control the answer. Um, so if they answer no, uh, you've just lost them. And so, right. um, but I think a lot of people, they write headlines that just aren't very interesting. Yeah. Um, you know, you, you look at, uh, you know, I don't know, you, it's, if you look at a newspaper, you know, when you read a newspaper, you look at the headline first of the news article right and if you don't see the words you don't see words there that that light us light it or flip a switch in your brain you're going to move on yeah um, but if you see words that are interesting to you that you're interested in that you want to know more about you're going to start reading um and a lot of headlines you know the the whole purpose of direct marketing is to talk only to people who we know are in our target market um, you know, I'm not going to try to sell you jewelry because that's not, you're not trying to buy jewelry. Right. Um, you know, there's no sense in trying to sell me a hearing aid right now because my hearing's fine. Um, so targeted marketing is the name of the game. So when we talk to people, when we talk to a market, we know who they are. We shouldn't say things that are a disconnect to what we think we know about them. Yeah. And so people will write headlines that, um, are just off base. They're they're not, they're not mm-hmm. speaking to what we know about these people. Can you remember uh, any uh, that uh, you remember reading or seeing that thinking this is such a disconnect? No, because I see it all the time. <laughs> I, I can't I can't think of a specific. Or on the uh, flip side, what are some that you have thought were really good, or ones that you uh, wrote that are really good? Uh, again, <laughs> I think they're all really good. Otherwise. <laughs> Um, I, I wouldn't give someone a headline that I didn't think was really good. Um, but what's, you know, what's one that, uh, you know, your headlines in general? So that this again, a little maybe off color, but yeah. I, I did a, a potency, you know, male potency piece okay. for a client, and it said, uh, in this case, I broke my own. Well, I broke my own rule, but. Kind of not. Uh, I said, you know, is this the end of Viagra? Um, you know, and people see that they're either in the market for Viagra or they're not. But these guys are. Um, I didn't put a question mark though. I put an ellipses and so left it open ended. But um, pe- people loved it. it was like, you mean that there's something better that I don't have to get a prescription for that doesn't have side effects that works just as well. Mm-hmm. That that will get the job done without having to go visit my doctor. You know, let me know. Let me know more. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. I like um, that one. Um. So, you know, the other thing is, you know, people obviously headlines is a huge thing. Any other what will be secondary that people make a lot of mistakes with that they should uh, really pay close attention to. Um. You know, sometimes it's just formatting. I see a lot of sales letters that you know are. You know, especially when it comes to I think the business to business realm. Mm-hmm. Um, so the premise is, I'm a business owner. I want to do business with you, Mister Business Owner, over here. And so they write them a letter that nobody wants to read because it's very boring, very official. Uh, you know, very uh, you know haughty. Just and I and they'll it, it never works. 
they come to me and say, we mailed this and it didn't work. And I'm so, I say to them, read this. Are you excited by what you just read? No, not really. Exactly. That's the problem is you think because this is business to business, people get in that B2B mindset, but it, mm. it's still one person to another person. Yeah. Um, you know, this, this happened the other day. I was doing some work for an agency in Chicago that, that their client is the American Medical Association. Um, they sell insurance to doctors. And so they were telling me, well, you know, they're doctors, so we need to speak to them differently. And I made this point of, you know, when they leave their office, they're just a consumer. They're just a guy or a lady, just like you and me. They're just people. Their job is to be a doctor, but that doesn't make them any better or different than you and I when we go to the grocery store or when we have to buy a car or flowers or, you know, anything. Right. You know, just because we're trying to reach them as a doctor doesn't mean they don't think like people. And so I see a lot of business to business. They keep it, they make it boring. It's so too professional. It's so dull and dry. And I think, you know, if you got this, would you be excited? Like, no, not not really. I'm like, well, let's let's speak to them. Let's add some excitement. Just because it's a, you know, a product or service that's business related doesn't mean it has to be boring and dull and uninteresting so what'd you do to spice it up or what'd they do uh well i propose and we're, we're we're still working through this this is a current project um and i was putting together you know some concepts for them but they uh that they agreed that, and they were willing to a little bit go more out uh, on that limb of you know treating them like people and not like doctors who are better than the rest of us yeah of course, we need doctors to save our lives and keep our bodies healthy, but they're still people, and they still react like we do as consumers. Mm -hmm. So I tried to share that with them and tell them why we could speak to them that way. Mm -hmm. So you know, since this inspired insider, Stephen, I always ask about what's been your lowest moment, and then how you push forward through it. Um. You know, for, for me as a copywriter, uh, as a freelance guy, um, you know, I, I, I tell people, you know, I, I, I eat what I kill. Um, it's up to me to find my own business. Right. Um, you know, it's mostly referred to me, but, you know, no, no I, don't have a, I don't have a sales guy out there um, finding work for me. And so, you know, there seems to, sometimes there's phases where sometimes I'm so overwhelmed with work that I don't really know how I'm going to do it. Sometimes it starts to taper off. Um, and sometimes there'll be a time when people are telling me how good I am and great and, uh, you know, great writer, good marketing head. Um, and I feel like, man, I'm, I must be doing a good job. But then all of a sudden there's these periods when, um, you know, everything is going to hell at the same time. This client's not happy and this piece didn't work. And yeah. This client's kind of slow to pay and it's like it all converges and I think uh, the sucky day or sucky week. It all hits uh, at once. Yeah, but it's not often. It's, you know, it's peaks and valleys and mm -hmm. I find out, I found the, the best way for me to deal with the life of a freelance copywriter. Yeah. Which is not difficult. It's not like I'm digging ditches for a living. It's it's still a pretty good gig, yeah. but it's just to keep my focus on taking good care of my clients. You know, writing my best, going the extra mile for them. Not not trying to figure out if I've spent too much time for what they paid me. Um, you know, I, I've got to focus on making sure everything I write is absolutely as good as I can get it and taking the time with it and like, you know, not being lazy like Peter taught me. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a matter of, uh, you know, things are going well or things are going well, trying to keep my head in check. I'm just a guy who does a job and I'm trying to do the best job I can. Um, and ultimately, I want my clients to succeed and we'll all succeed together if we can do that. So how do you keep your head in check? Like when all that stuff happens at once, the perfect storm where you have you know, a client's unhappy and, you know, another person's calling, another person's slow to, to pay. Yeah. What do you do to kind of push through that and kind of, you know, when you're in that, it's a little bit easier said than done to, to get out of it. Because um, it never lasts. 
if if it did, that would spell a large that would that would indicate a larger problem that my business is never going well, <laughs> that something's wrong. Um, but the low points and the bad times, uh, they're not common. They're not always. They're usually things run pretty well because I I take. I want to be in control of the the process in the situation, and uh, you know I'm not a control freak, but I want things to go the way I want them to go. Mm-hmm. So the the low times don't come about that often. When they do, I have to remember that during ten years of me being on my own, there's never been a sustained period of time when it just sucked all the time. <laughs> it was for a day or a week or a week and a half until it you know was resolved and. Uh, you know, over 10 years, very rarely, I can count on one hand times I have not been paid for some reason or another, it rarely happens. I'm able to appease clients, I think that's how they work working with me, because I'm not uh, fanatical, I'm not demanding, I'm not, uh, I don't think I'm, you know, God's gift to copywriting, but they know they can talk to me and, and reason with me, and we can, you know, get things done. Yeah. So on the other side, Stephen, what's been... One of the proudest moments. Uh, I don't know. I don't know if I have a proudest moment. I mean, I've uh, you know I've spoken at the DMA a couple times, um, which was good. Um, you know, I've landed some big clients and some big fees. Uh, you know, I, I've done work for most of the big direct marketing companies in this country and even around the world. And, you know, when I get them, you know, I know it's because I, I've worked hard to, to develop and keep a reputation as being a good writer and a good guy in general and someone that's easy to work and deal with. They yeah. know they can trust me. Um, proud moments? I, there was, I don't was know. a time where you celebrated, like you remember just pumping your fist that you got this big contract or big client and maybe you, you took a vacation or you did something selfish. Uh, you bought something fun. Uh, I'm good at taking vacations. Okay. Um, I did, you know, I think the first time I ever got put on a retainer, um, I had a client <laughs> agree to pay me a certain, you know, set amount a month. Um, and I went and bought a Hummer. <laughs> I had a Jeep and uh, I've always wanted a Hummer. So I went and bought a big black uh, pimped out Hummer and told my wife that uh, his monthly payments were more than going to pay for the Hummer. And she rolled her eyes and said, that's fine. And uh, it was the first, I'd had some nice cars, but it was the first car that I had that I really, really, really wanted, mm-hmm. that I was really psyched to own. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I did that That's once. a good one. I like that one. You need that every once in a while, right? Every once in a while. Yeah. Not that you need a Hummer every every day or anything, but... Um, so, Stephen, I have one last question for you. I appreciate your time and, and sharing your great stories. Um, first, tell people where they can find you. Where should, you know, where should they check, out, uh, check you out online? Uh, skcopywriting.com. Now, how did you come up with the – so you have the headline. It's a pretty cool graphical – when you scroll down, the kind of words go off the page and then they come together. What made you think of that? And uh, I had nothing to do with it. I, ha- I had a cool web designer. You had to agree to it, though. So you thought it was it was good. He, he, he was he's very talented, very very talented web designer, and I uh, had an old site that I didn't like, and I said I really need something uh, punchy. I need something cool. You know, a lot of people don't really go to my website. It, it's mostly there uh, to make sure that I'm legitimate, that I'm really You're a real person. person. Yeah. Right. Um, rarely does anybody find me because they went searching for me. Almost all my uh, work comes from referrals and repeat mm-hmm. clients, and so um, I need at least needed to look good. You know, it's like the you know the shoemakers kids with their bare feet. I mm-hmm. had to at least have a website that did me justice. Yes, for sure. So yeah, so it's skcopywriting.com. Uh, Steve, my last question is: you know, we've talked a lot about a lot of different stories from direct response um, campaigns. What should we leave people with? I mean, there's a lot that we talked about. What should they start doing now or what can we leave them? What kind of advice should we leave them with? Hmm. 
uh, you know, it's like it says on my website, uh, uh, marketing is, you know, some people look at it as a necessary evil. Some, some companies love it, but you can't sell, you can't sell something that people don't know about. And so, uh, you know, every, almost any company does some form of marketing somewhere, TV, radio, advert, you know, print, uh, mail, whatever it is on the web, um, you know, and some of them just do a bad job because they don't know what they don't know what a good job is. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I, I think a lot of companies are just missing the point with uh, their marketing. They they don't realize what they could be doing with it, um, or they don't understand their market well enough, or they don't understand their message. You know what it should be, and they haven't built a good enough foundation to start with. And um, you know, I'm always happy to help, you know, consult with, I'll spend as much time on the phone with the client as they want me to, to help them get their head in the marketing game and understand it from my point of view. You know, they're busy running their company. Um, that takes up their time. And so sometimes they just don't have the time to devote to figuring out what their customer wants to hear. And so, uh, you know, whether they get it from me or from someone else, it's worth the investigation of uh, getting those core core thoughts down on paper. Yeah, so repeat those again because I think those are important. You know, you want people to find out one, kind of who their target customer is, right? Right, who are they selling to? Uh, you know, what, what are they selling? Who are they selling to? Where are they gonna find them? And what are they gonna tell them? Yeah. Um, you know, so they, they, they need to answer those questions. You know, somebody taught me, uh, remember who or when, you know, to, to, to picture the person who is my target audience. You know, what are they wearing? Where do they live? What car do they drive? What kind of house do they live in? Do they have kids? What's their job? What do they like to do on weekends? Uh, you know, really understand the life of the, uh, that, you know, individual. Right. Um, most companies, I think, have not done that. Um, they, they have not put that much thought into who they're trying to sell to. Yeah. You know, it's a lot of it's just experience. I've been doing it for so long, it's second nature to me. But I understand that that's not second nature. There's so many other parts of running a business that, uh, you know, have to be tended to. Yeah. Steven, this has been fantastic. I very much appreciate it. Uh, thank you so Good. much. You bet. Yeah. All right. I appreciate the time. All right. See ya.